Hello and welcome to uh, Overcoming Barriers to Smart Transportation for Underserved Communities, brought to you by Ride Report. I am Symbiat Yusuf, Communications Associate with Forth, and I will be moderating this webinar today. Attendees, please make sure you submit all your questions through the attendee chat, and we will get through all of those questions at the end of the presentations. The button is on your top left corner, and we will also be sending out the webinar slides and presentation after this today. Before we get started, a little bit about Forth. Forth is a nonprofit trade association advocating for electric, shared, and smart mobility. We focus on, we work in four main focus areas, which are industry development, demonstration projects, advocacy, and consumer engagement. Please, you can find more information about Forth, our membership, and our work at forthmobility.org. And this uh, coming June, we will be um, working with EDTA for, to present EVS 33. The fourth roadmap conference will be held in conjunction with EVS 33. Fourth is supporting the 33rd International Electric Vehicle Symposium as the local host organization. EVS 33 will be held in June um, 14th through the 17th of 2020. And make sure to show your support for Fourth when registering by using code EVS 33 Fourth, which will grant you access to our VIP reception and a chance to win a ticket to our roadmap conference in 2021. We hope to see you all there. Our speakers today are Ford's Program Manager, Sergio Lopez, and Vivian Satterfield, Director of Strategic Partnership at Verde. Sergio leads the de delivery of pilot projects that advances sustainable and socially equitable transportation. He also manages the Go Forth Electric Showcase in downtown Portland. He previously worked at Bike Town as a customer relations specialist and brand ambassador, and also as an assistant researcher at Portland. in Southern California and spent his childhood summers in Mexico, where both of his parents are from. Growing up in a low-income household, Sergio is passionate about the work Ford delivers. He holds a BS in cultural anthropology from Portland State University. Vivian is a second-generation Chinese-American born and raised in Chicago. Since relocating to Portland in 2008, she has worked in community at the intersection of environmental, racial, and economic justice, rooted in movement building principle and progressive values. Vivian is an organizer, policy shaper, and coalition builder. Here is a brief outline of um, what we'll be getting into today. We'll be discussing the need for community-based needs assessments, why they're important, and the work um, that's being done for transportation, past projects, current projects and program, and we'll have a brief update on the cruise project at the end of the webinar. And we want to say thank you to our sponsor, Ride Report. Ride Report empowers cities to bring new, clean forms of transportation to life. They handle data for cities and operate around the world. Before we move on to the presentations, I will we will get hear a few words from Alexis Johnson. She is the head of engineering at Ride Report. Alexis, hi everyone. Um, thanks so much for joining today. I should be really quick. Um, we're really thrilled to be sponsoring this webinar today. Um, Ride Report as a company build software that um, we get that city governments use to aggregate and analyze data about how uh, people are using the new micromobility fleets in cities. Um, and we really believe that uh, empowering cities to be able to manage these new transportation systems is going to provide transportation um, for a lot of for a lot of uses that we haven't previously had, and particularly so much of what we um, hope for in the future of our transportation systems are being able to um, provide access to less accessible places in urban areas and to populations that have had traditionally less access to transportation. So I'm so grateful to live in a city with organizations like Verde and Forth who are um, having conversations with these communities and figuring out how to serve them better. And we're really excited to be here and 
and to learn from, from you all. So thank you. Thank you, Alexis. As a reminder to the attendees, um, please feel free to submit all your questions through the attendee chat. Um, we will get through them as um, at the end of the webinar. And again, the button is on the top left bar. Um, you see an attendee chat um, button. And with that, I will turn over the controls to Vivian Everde, and she will speak on the need for a community-based needs assessment when developing transportation. Um, transportation. Hi, thanks everybody. It's great to be here. Uh, special thanks, of course, to Fourth Mobility and the team there and to Ride Report as well for sponsoring this excellent webinar. It's great to see so many folks joining us today. Um, you know, in an era and a time in which transportation and technology and mobility options are moving and developing rapidly and quickly. I mean, we're using technology today that we could not have imagined five years ago. Um, and it's a part of our daily life. Lives. Uh, you know, I've been really lucky and honored actually to be able to work with two organizations in the past uh, six years here in Portland, Oregon, uh, to dive deep into transportation needs. So I'm going to share a little bit about both of them. I do want to say that I'll be presenting a lot of slides that will show data. And I'm sure that as you're viewing these, you'll wish that some of the slides um, we could spend more time on. Don't worry, we'll be sending out these slides after the webinar. There's a ton of data in them. So um, I hope that by giving the overview and by giving you the information, you can take that and digest it and feel free to reach back out to me if you have any questions or have some deeper dive conversations that you want to have about it um, after the webinar and we'll make ourselves available. So um, Verde is a community-based organization here in Portland, Oregon. Uh, we work in the Cully neighborhood and we've actually done a number of different projects over the years engaging with the low-income communities and communities of color. Um, there's a high concentration of the Latinx community here in the Cully neighborhood. We'll touch on that later as to why there are these concentrated pockets of not only low-income people, but communities of color here in Portland, Oregon. There's absolutely a land use component here. And so if we kind of put on our urban environmental justice lens um, to understand why uh, geography and land use plays such a large role, then we have a better understanding of the current conditions um, as it relates to mobility and transportation access in Cully. So I just wanted to share, there's actually a really wonderful interactive story map that we have available on the Verde website, um, working with our Living Cully partnerships um, you know, really we're able to start doing some of our initial advocacy around walking and pedestrian access and active transportation in the Cully neighborhood. So I just wanted to share a little bit in the history, um, and this is a really interactive um, story map that can walk you through um, the work that we did uh, starting actually before 2013. Um, which really leads us to a really exciting time now and what we're looking forward to, the redevelopment of um, what was the Living Cully Plaza and formerly then before it was a two block um, emporium of, uh, called the Sugar Shack that uh, was actually a really negative aspect on the community. Um, not only was it an entertainment establishment, there also was documented money laundering and sex trafficking uh, happening in, in the Sugar Shack. And so uh, through a crowd raising and advocacy uh, campaign, uh, Verde and our partners um, we're lucky with Hacienda Community Development Corporation um, and other uh, Living Cully partnerships. We're able to acquire the site, and now not only have we acquired it um, and demoed the former Sugar Shack, now we are building um, 140 units of family housing, affordable housing here in partnership with Hacienda CDC, which will be known as, as Las Adelitas, which is so very exciting. Uh, Hacienda's headquarters is located right across the street. This is in the heart of the Cully neighborhood, um, but it's bordered by some really high traffic corridors. Um, we have some of our busiest streets moving through here, and it's a, really a thorough way for people to access um, the highway, the 205, and then, of course, the industrial Columbia cor corridor. So, um, you know, we're super excited to have 
uh, you know, a growing community and to be able to stably house people through affordable housing. Um, but this Las Adelitas development is going to house 140 families. And yet um, we're only building in, Hacienda is only building in 70 parking spaces. So this really highlights the need um, to talk more about uh, mobility, talk about um, different transportation options besides a single use vehicle, single occupancy vehicle. <laughs> Not single use vehicle. That <laughs> that would be pretty awful if they were only single use. So because there was this cat, this, you know, this is building. So the history is that there's been this building conversation around transportation access, again, because of the demographics of the community and because um, this community experiences a lot of transportation injustice because of land use design, um, because of the transportation systems design, and because of a lot of barriers to accessing even public transportation. Um, you know, there's not a lot of um, car ownership, not a lot of even bike ownership. And so we wanted to take a deeper dive to understand what the transportation access uh, baseline was, uh, especially in this community. Um, and, and so therefore we conducted a needs assessment um, and we did both surveys and also did focus groups so again, we wanted to understand the current transportation needs and behaviors. We also wanted to understand the participants' familiarity with these alternative forms of transportation. And we included electrification here, like EVs, electric bikes, and also different ride sharing and car sharing. Um, and we also want to identify participants' ideal future state. Because a lot of times we go into communities and, um, you know, there's not a lot of folks ask, like, what do you actually want? And so that's the role of a community-based organization, um, especially one that is justice-centered, is to um, actively ask, what is it that you actually want and how can we get there together? Of course, we want to identify what solutions uh, we could have for this redevelopment in Las Aralitas and, uh, of course, understand our basic demographic profile of participants. So this was really targeted um, for this particular site. So here's just some data if you want to know, you know, the ages, uh, the income levels, and the predominant race. As you can see, um, income level-wise, this does skew, uh, again, lower income. That's not surprising because we're in the Cully neighborhood and we were really focusing this on existing residents of Cully um, and then predominantly Latinx respondents. So what are the preferred methods of transportation? Um, you know, 41% of the respondents, uh, the residents here, said they are, they preferred actually driving, um, and then the 40% preferred using public transportation. So even though car share was listed as a survey choice, not one person <laughs> responded that that was their preferred transportation. Um, and I think part of that is because a lack of a presence of car sharing companies in the Cully neighborhood. Uh, you could say that the Cully neighborhood is actually redlined in a way from a lot of these services. Um, and also, interestingly enough, uh, the respondents prefer to use a traditional taxi service uh, rather than a rideshare service. <clears throat> Pardon me. And we'll talk a little bit more about why why that is, because um, I think that is directly correlated not only to uh, race, but also um, income level here. And then, of course, the commute times were, were really variable. So, of course, that's no surprise to anyone who relies on public transit. Um, if you're taking it a lot, your commute time is probably going to be longer, and especially here in the Cully neighborhood. So what are some of the solutions that, that people uh, really wanted to see? Uh, here's a breakdown of sort of the responses that people offered. Um, a lot of interest in obviously shared EVs and more charging stations, recognizing as we, um, this technology is becoming uh, more familiar to folks, that they're very interested. And there's also a very, very high value um, in uh, environmental preservation. Um, that's really a huge focus of Verde's work is, you know, environmental wealth building. Uh, we actually help build Cully Park, a new park asset uh, in the Cully community. So there's a really high uh, value that residents place um, in the environment. And so shared e-bikes or scooters, also very high, uh, special access to discount, you know, Lyft, Uber, rideshare, um, community owed rideshare services. Uh, some sort of lending circle um, and in order to share the cost of transportation options. Um, my understanding is this is really uh, familiar, especially in the Latinx community, this idea of a lending circle. And then uh, a Cully neighborhood shuttle for Las Adelitas residents. 
So that was really focused on, um, you know, the Cully neighborhood specifically. And as this last Adelitas development, we actually just received really great news from the city of Portland uh, that the, the project is going to be eligible for a special pot of funding and will be coming online. So if you're in the Cully neighborhood, um, please drop by. You'll be seeing a lot of uh, action and activity there. And hopefully we'll have a new building um, up in the next two years and, you know, a whole host of new households living there. I did also want to touch on uh, another needs assessment that I had the privilege of conducting and publishing actually in partnership with Portland State University um, during my time at, as the Deputy Director of Opal Environmental Justice Oregon. And I wanted to share some of the interesting findings from this because while the Verde assessment really focused in on the Las Arolitas redevelopment and some of the work that was happening and was really targeted in understanding the needs of Cully, um, the, the Opal 4th and PSU project um, was really focusing on East Portland uh, geographically and, you know, uh, demographically was really focusing on low income uh, residents of Portland more broadly. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about smart mobility. Of course, here's just some examples of that. And this was really to help inform the Portland Smart Cities uh, proposal to the DOT. There's some actually really cool stuff in here, and there's um, a few things uh, that Verde is continuing to work on, such as data and access and privacy. Some questions we posed, you know, as public transportation providers and agencies move to both payment information, trip planning, and these first and last mile connectivity systems, which require travelers to have access to private internet and banking services, what steps can be taken to ensure that the coming wave of these smart transportation innovations will benefit all groups equitably? And of course, even better, can we achieve transportation justice? There's a lot of existing research on these issues. There's also a slide at the end of the presentation I'll share with a lot of resources if you really want to do a deep dive um, and see what, what other research is in the field around this. These were our research questions want to go ahead and identify our transportation disadvantaged communities. Again, uh, low income, communities of color, mobility challenge, age, uh, and then level of English proficiency. And, you know, we really focused on East Portland uh, geographically. And so our low income communities and communities of color um, are concentrated here. Here's some just maps for those of you who uh, may not be fam as familiar with our demographic spread. And I know that Sergio will be touching on this later as well, but um, you know we have had a demonstrated uh, displacement of people of color from the inner core, and that's where you can see that ochre color um, in the urban dense part of the city. And then where you see the uh, percentage change, those those larger blue dots is where you see a growth, um, you know, in communities of uh, people of people of color. And so we have this demonstrated shift. Um, and we can talk more about why that is. It has a lot to do with our land use systems and our rising real estate prices, as well as uh, very weak uh, regulation um, on especially rental properties. Um, but that's why we focus on East Portland. So again, as the the Living Cully and um, uh, Cully Base Needs Assessment did, uh, we also conducted focus groups um, and also did a larger sample survey. So you can see kind of the study area that we focused on and then our survey sample respondents, how they responded. So again, a higher concentration of lower income people who self-identified. A little bit more about the age, again, looking at the study area and then our survey sample just to demonstrate, you know, that we were extremely targeted in wanting to reach out to um, lower income communities of color. And we were successful in doing that. All of this data will be available to you after the webinar. But let's get to the results. Um, wanted to identify some of these basic transportation issues and you know around transportation access. So here we see higher more in the income. Um, it demonstrates that those who have higher income just have more access to support for commuting, whether it's because of an employer subsidized transit pass or because uh, due to their income level, um, they're able to uh, own uh, or lease a, uh, their own car. What about their commuting behavior, how they get around? Um, actually, lower income people are more multimodal and they actually use uh, you know, ride sourcing, TNCs, Ubers, Lyfts for commuting um, more than higher income people. This is something that surprised me in the findings. 
we asked some questions around how they uh, currently pay for transit. And unsurprisingly, lower income people and people of color um, have less use of the online or phone apps in order to pay for transit and much higher use of onboard cash payment. So cash is king. Another barrier to access currently is documentation, data, and banking. Um, here, especially in Oregon, uh, we, not all folks, especially undocumented folks, have had access to the right to drive, and that's been a very large issue. But access to data in the internet um, is also a very big deal as well. Uh, although, you know, internet and data access was fairly high for everyone, um, lower income and people of color uh, tend to to not access um, these data, these robust data plans as much as higher income people, and that limits their access. Access to banking and credit. This was where we had a huge issue. Um, this actually surprised me to learn, um, you know, through these surveys, how underbanked our communities are. Um, this is clearly something that we need to address here as well. Uh, this question also asked about a driver's license, and uh, higher income people were more likely to respond that they had a driver's license. There's also the familiarity and comfort with these new technologies. Um, you don't see a lot of, again, because, you know, especially in East Portland, also the Cully neighborhood, we don't see as many, uh, for example, um, uh, right, Reach Now was a service that actually is just announced that they'll be ending, but we didn't even have that service uh, really readily available in these neighborhoods. And so even seeing these uh, these services available will will spark um, sort of like, hey, what is that? Let me figure out, find out more about it, and it'll gain familiarity these technologies. But if you don't see these in available in your neighborhood, um, then you're less likely to have familiarity with them. So we asked a little bit more about the impressions of these new transportation technologies. And not surprisingly, lower income folks and people of color identified as having less familiarity and were less comfortable with new vehicle technologies. So interestingly enough, um, lower income folks and people of color had more use of existing smart mobility apps. Um, but there's, there's a barrier to having familiarity around it. Um, from the focus groups, just wanted to call out that language is still a huge barrier um, around access. Uh, one of the respondents replied that um, when there was uh, an issue downtown, you know, the instructions were only given in English when they were writing on transit. And so in a situation like that, you know, where, quote, I don't know what the screen or the conductor is saying, then it's frustrating. It makes you fearful. Um, and so even though this person was familiar and did know how to ride transit, um, some, they were giving, being given a special announcement but was only given in English, and they really didn't know what was going on. So many smartphone apps, transit signage, um, are just not available in languages other than English. Or if they do have options that are available in languages other than English, there's a multi-step um, process that first happens in English before you can get to that setting um, to, to put it in a language that's, that's more preferred for the user. Also, very high trust, privacy, and security issues. And you know, because of this part of our survey findings, actually, Verde is launching um, a new project. I hope to be able to talk more broadly about it uh, soon. It's very, very exciting around addressing this very issue um, that folks, you know, really don't have a lot of trust in traditional systems. Um, that you know, while they may have a bank account, they're afraid that a third party uh, use, you know, might access it and use it, um, or even they just don't have any information on their phone. They're really afraid that folks will hack it. Um, because, you know, identity theft can be really devastating to a low-income person. Um, and these issues are not as appreciated by, by folks who, you know, may are be very familiar with two, you know, two-factor authentication, um, or who have the time to, you know, take a lunch break to go physically into a bank in order to deal with identity theft issues. Um, our, our folks are responding that they clearly are not as familiar. Um, or have as much trust in these systems. So knowing all that, um, you know, what are some of the recommended policies? Uh, we did go ahead and rank them. Uh, this is really similar to some of the findings that we saw in the Cully-based needs assessment as well. Um, really what folks needed, just like anyone who rides uh, transit, is real-time information and communication between uh, transit and riders around crowding, arrival times. Uh, it's especially critical when folks are transit dependent. Uh, they may be going to the grocery store and bringing along some small children. Um, 
and if they're juggling all of these, uh, you know, and then the, the bus comes but passes them up because it's overcrowded due to maybe there's two wheelchair users on board um, and a few strollers and then they can't accommodate another household, um, that's very, very frustrating and the wait times are longer. Um, I think a really great idea as well is access to public Wi-Fi and charging stations for smartphones. Uh, if you're riding transit all day, having access to a place to charge your phone can be really critical. Um, and also public Wi-Fi, again, because data plans are expensive, especially if they're not getting subsidized. Um, of course, rebates are financing to help buy clean electric vehicles, and we're thankful that Fourth Mobility is really ahead of the curve on that. Um, again, the language access is really key. And then uh, this idea of the autonomous neighborhood shuttle and microtransit, again, because these neighborhoods are uh, further out from the central core of Portland, they're actually not very well served by transit. There's these long uh, distances and gaps um, and especially, you know, in the Cully neighborhood, the most accessible grocery store is uh, definitely walkable, but it takes about 20 minutes from the closest, uh, you know, concentration of where we have affordable housing. Um, you can drive a car and you can definitely be there in less than 10 minutes. But if you were going to choose transit for that ride to go to the grocery store, um, it's not a direct route. You'd have to trip chain and it would take you at least 45 minutes, if not more. So clearly there's a need for this sort of like... Um, Micro transit, um, which uh, currently traditional transportation providers are not uh, addressing. This is more just talking about our relevant findings. So again, big thanks to all of our survey respondents and focus group participants. And as promised, you can dive in uh, at the end of this webinar to the, all these additional resources. There's a lot of research out there, um, and so you can definitely nerd out on that. Thank you so much, Vivian. Um, attendees, like we said, please remember, ask all your questions via the attendee chat. We will get to them after Sergio's presentation. And at this time, we'll hand the baton over to Sergio and we will hear from him on Ford's effort on community engagement. Awesome, well, thank you, Simbi, Vivian, and Alexis for um, that first half of the hour. Um, so my name is Sergio Lopez. I'm a program manager here at Fourth, and I'm going to go over some of the projects that we've done here at Fourth that overview a lot of the um, transportation equity um, efforts that we've done, and specifically in Coley neighborhood, and what have we done recently in the last year, and then what we're actually going to be doing in the next following year. So a brief overview, but I do want to start off and kind of set the tone on on where this all rooted from and what we're doing to kind of transition and make sure that. Uh, while we have opportunity with new transportation options, we have also an opportunity to change the policies and change the social norms on what it is to have transportation for everyone that is clean and that is electric and that is sustainable. So the main thing is just kind of defining equality versus equity. Um, for, for a lot of us, this is familiar, but for a lot of us, it also isn't. You know, equality, we're giving, we're giving everyone the same access of resource or equity, we're giving people the right amount of access to resource for everyone to succeed. So when a, when a local example is the TriMet bus for that Opal, and actually Vivian was a, a part of, which big props to them, was giving low-income um, residents $150 fares for TriMet, where usually it's $250. So it's giving people the right amount of um, access to for them to succeed. And so to kind of dig more deeper on you know what it means as an urban development that overlaps with transportation as redlining, and defining what that means, back in the 1960s, there was a urban development um, policy that essentially limited people of demographic that were deemed high risk of bank loans, et cetera. And this has kind of actually caused a lot of, through the decades, some impact on urban development. And as you can see, the red zones in this map do define that the demographics were higher risk because of the um, because of the ethnicity, and where yellow was, they were deemed as not as risky, and then blue was actually a prime spot. So if we fast forward, what, 60, 70 years now, actually, um, we're almost in 2020, um, the blue zones are obviously there, but the red zones, as you know, over here on Alberta, Mississippi, um, Division, et cetera, those are all now more gentrified. So kind of the premise on the first slide that I just mentioned was more so while we had these new options of transportation, it's a good opportunity for us to kind of um, change that norm and dig deeper and give opportunity for everyone that needs the transportation. So. So now to dig actually more into the demonstration projects that we've done here at Fourth, um, Community EV um, Electric Vehicle Project or Community E-Bike Project and our Uber Rideshare Futuro. Um, and I'm going to dig a little and give a deep deeper and dig more about both our EV project and our e-bike program. 
So our community electric vehicle project was started back in March of 2017. This was in partnership with Hacienda CDC, Honda, and Pacific Power, the utility company um, that oversees in the Cole neighborhood. So essentially, we were, get, we were donating three Honda Fit EVs, or use, either use electric cars that range about 80 miles of, of range on a full battery. And essentially, um, what this project did was we wanted to test and give residents of Hacienda the opportunity to have different modes of transportation in the Cole neighborhood. As Vivian has just described right now, Cole neighborhood has gone through a lot of um, displacement, but also just undeserved and lack of transportation options. Um, there are five bus tracks that run through Coley, and on Sundays, they would vary one an hour. So you don't have much access to any other form, whether if you want to get from point A to point B. So it's the most diverse area in Oregon. It's 43% of residents are renters, and 85% of Coley students qualify for free reduced lunch. Um, it was redlined by Get Around because it was deemed high risk because of the demographic percentage. And it is adjacent to rail lines and industrial yards and to the airports right off Columbia Avenue. So one of our main methods and our main purpose for this project was to give residents an opportunity to get from point A to point B on specific times and options that the bus line wouldn't really do. At the time, Bike Town wasn't operating there, but now it does. So that's been a huge um, plus for the residents there. And I know and I know get around um, and Get around actually specifically doesn't still operate there, but Turo does. So we use Turo for that platform for the residents to use. And I know car to go and reach now are no longer going to operate in the city of Portland. So that's another barrier that's limiting um, all of residents actually. So, so one of the things that while we were promoting this project is we learned that a lot of residents there didn't have access to a driver's license. Um, we, part of our survey didn't ask why, it was just a question of whether they did or didn't and to see how that was going to affect the program. So d during that same process, we had the opportunity to create another project called the Community Electric Bicycle Project, which was in partnership with the Community Cycling Center, um, with Gen Z, um, they donated a 10 um, e-bikes for us to lend to the residents. And, um, ABSE, which is in this picture, ABC, um, translates on the, um, acronym Anando en Bicicletas en Coli, which translates into Riding Bikes in Coli, is a community um, partner, um, community group. Um, they're most Asiana residents, and they work really, um, they basically work with the Community Cycling Center to help fund their efforts in getting the kids active transportation, safe routes to school, bikes, et cetera. So we thought e-bikes would be a good component, and we wanted to test that out. In the background, that's actually the where Living Coli is going to have the Salitas as um, Dylan was mentioning, and to give a little background on what the importance of all this is, Las Adelitas, for those who don't know, is a re is a reference to La Adelita, which is a Mexican Revolution folklore song that honors all the Mexican soldiers for the Mexican Revolution. So there's a lot of meaning behind that, and as Vivian also mentioned, um, this is, has a history of just um, bad trafficking and bad business in general. So it's really exciting to see how this is going to shape out and moving forward, forth, and better than other partners um, hope to kind of build more of a Micro mobility hub in this specific location. So, back to the community e bike project. So, the community e bike project was a great opportunity for us, for Hacienda, for the CCC, which is the Community Cycling Center, to kind of identify and see, you know, if electric cars aren't working, well, where are e bikes going to stand in this place? And, you know, now e scooters, for example. One of the things that we learned um, with the electric vehicle project was. And that was mainly that people couldn't drive an electric car because they didn't have documentation or a license, for example. Um, but just by not even through data, but just by being out um, in the potlucks and the posadas, et cetera, we learned that a lot of people just didn't know how to drive a car in general, whether it was electric or not. So this is a good option for us to kind of test the benefits of what the community e-bike actually meant. So we had 10 e-bikes from Gen Z. Um, we, through the grant, we were able to fund and buy some panniers. Um, some reflective lights, some helmets, both a U-lock and a cable for safety. And through each cohort, which there were three, we did a pre-orientation where we basically gave the individuals um, a one-on-one -on, -one on how to use the bikes. That included bike etiquette on the road, which was, you know, left turn signal, right turn signal, bike lane usage, the greenways in Portland, Oregon, et cetera. It also included how do you charge your e-bike and how do you take the battery out? Um, these bikes can be seen as an item of theft, and that's one thing that we did learn through the case study and through the surveying. So it was really important for us to, to kind of give a one-on-one -on, -one on how do you lock the e-bike without the battery specifically, um, which would include the front tire and frame. How do you take the battery out? Charging an e-bike is much easier than an EV, um, but it's good to kind of go through all these premises. 
and we can give you the case study and it'll be linked to the actual uh, follow-up that SIB is sending. But one of the things that we learned in this one was that it was a high risk of theft, even though they aren't flashy, it's still a different looking bike. Um, and one bike did get stolen. Um, and that was out on like 122nd, I think in the Rockaway um, area. Um, but given that the, in, the, in the time span of March to November of that year, um, these bikes did rack up 4,000 miles of usage, which is essentially cross country, I think. Um, so it was really interesting to see how these bikes were actually used um, and he used them the most. Part of that cohort also defined with um, students of uh, Portland Community College. This was done in, this, this effort was done actually through um, Ira Dixon, who was a former program manager at Community Studying Center. This kind of happened coincidentally, it wasn't really a, a main target, but while we were recruiting people to use the bikes, we were like, oh, like community college students need to go from campus, you know, in Cascade to Southeast, which is pretty far away, or vice versa, or even go to the west side over the hill. And a lot of these students didn't drive because of the age. So it was a really good opportunity for us to kind of give a 360 view on people who don't drive in general. Um, and this cohort was specifically in the summertime, so we got the most usage out of that. Um, and this is, I think this was the cohort that the bike got stolen as well. So I think with more demand, there's more, there's more risk. So I think that was a good thing and no one got hurt. Um, but the Portland Community College um, cohort was also a big learning factor for us to, to know what it means for students and whatnot. And this is a picture of a community cycling center uh, staff fixing one of the bikes over in New Columbia, which is based in North, East, North Portland. That is a program ran through the community cycling center. So now as we're in the last year or so, specifically the last summer, um, the consumer engagement for us of fourth is a huge, huge umbrella of our work. Um, this picture right here is a go forth electric showcase, which is located in the heart of downtown Portland. And it's basically our method of introducing this electric vehicle and electric methods of transportation to different types of um, consumers, whether it's internal or external of work. One of the things that we, we try to do here is make sure that the lingo of, you know, charging stations and electric cars and kilowatts per hour, Chatamo, et cetera, kind of translate well to the consumers. So everyone has a fair resource to the technology. Um, we're not all engineers, including myself. So when I first hear kilowatts per hour, I kind of get dizzy. Not really, but it's a little a bit of a dues. So the big part of consumer engagement is to make sure that it's not only in downtown, but that the efforts that we're doing at the showcase in downtown are also being done citywide, worldwide, and nationwide, and to the communities that actually need the transportation that it, people that it can benefit. So recently, one of the things that we did, um, and this is a picture that we have at the showcase, the banner um, that has different languages of saying welcome. So one of the recent efforts that we did was in partnership with PGE. Um, we were contracted by PGE to give local community-based organizations, nonprofits, agencies, um, technical assistance on the application. As I mentioned, um, if you Google electric cars or if you Google charging stations and you start reading forums and and blogs and articles, you're going to start reading a lot of terms that are kind of difficult to define. J1772 being one of the plugs for an electric car, for example. Um, there are essentially three different kinds if you're looking at fast charging. So one of our methods here was to kind of work with CBOs, um, work with nonprofits, and kind of help them out with writing an application that will make sure that they acquire um, the right amount of technology. What this grant fund essentially did is $1.75 million is being, going to be allocated to CBOs on making sure that they're getting um, clean and reliable technology for um, their work and more importantly to the community that they serve. That they, um, that they serve. So we had three levels of engagement with these CBOs. Level one being very simple and very just one-on-one, giving electric vehicle one-on-one, charging station one-on-one, giving them tips on different types of cars that could work. Level two was a little more uh, thorough um, and, involved, and involved some more drafting the RFP and where level three was more heavy hands-on and actually helping them write. A lot of these nonprofits were, in, were companies that were three to five people. So we wanted to make sure that if they didn't have the bandwidth, both personnel and financially, that we were there to help them develop that because we wanted to see all types of nonprofits apply. Um, we had this internal joke saying we wanted the center for save the otters apply for an EV. Um, so that was kind of always our reference of example, because um, a lot of nonprofits, frankly, just don't have the budget to apply for something that's new out of their scope of work. Uh, but frankly, transportation is the most utilized um, 
form and highest expense in any household. So um, we wanted to make sure that there was an overlap there because there, there essentially is. So this PG grant fund would include, um, here's three examples, just surface level, government agency or nonprofit group buying electric vehicles to, to support um, vulnerable populations, a subsidized electric car share located in an apartment complex, kind of like Hacienda, and other activities that don't involve actual physical or electric infrastructure, but frankly can involve just outreach education for the benefits of electric transportation. If you have more information regarding this grant fund or the process of or potentially future opportunities, please um, contact um, Dan Janosek. His email is listed right here. Um, if not, reach out to us and we can forward any specific questions for the grant fund to um, Dan and the team over at PGE. And then so I'm gonna the, stay with consumer engagement and focus more on what's happening right now as, as I speak, um, and that's the e-scooters. Um, the e-scooters have been a thing in the last year and we're in the middle of pilot 2.0 that is being permitted by PBOT, the Portland Bureau of Transportation. This is a picture of Lime um, and Owen, who's one of our local um, Portland scooter wizards. And so we've been doing workshops um, with different companies to essentially educate consumers and customers about electric scooter etiquette that includes safety, um, where to ride, where not to ride, wear helmets, um, things you can and can't do, et cetera. So a lot of these ones began in June of this past year. And right here is a picture of 19 of us um, in front of the showcase doing a little skate um, scooter workshop. And these scooter workshops, a free helmet, $10 credit for um, the scooters, and a little run down Needle Parkway or the local vicinity on using your hand signal turns, stop signs, et cetera. Um, and we have, in the summertime, we conducted three scooter workshops. Um, in the past month, we did one. And now with quarter four, we have a few lined up. And one of the things that I kind of want to state here and introduce to everyone that's listening, um, whether you're local or, or, or non, is that fourth is offering a good opportunity um, to kind of um, get these workshops outside of downtown. It's great to start them here because we have the physical resource, which is a showcase. Um, but we want to provide the opportunity for CBOs, community centers, um, anyone who lives in a neighborhood that thinks they that they or the community that it serves want to ride the scooters. One of the biggest um, barriers in these scooters is that they're all technology based. You, you, need an, you need a credit card, you need an app in order to ride them. So what can we do? What can the companies do? And PBOT is pushing for that to make sure that everyone is getting access to these scooters. And coming from both the public and private sector, we just want to make sure that people can ride them safely. So if we're fulfilling both circles there, we're happy to help in any way. Um, and here is a list of our coming scooter workshops, one of them being in Charlotte, which is actually through our Bloomberg work. But I did want to state that, that we are going out there to teach the curriculum on what it means to meet city demands and make sure that people are being taught the right etiquette on these scooters. We have one coming up on the 20th of October at the Go Forth Olympic Showcase, which is in downtown. And then we have one on Halloween here at the field's office, which can be in conjunction with a ride and drive event. And um, costumes are, are um, yeah, recommended. So if you wanted to come in um, dressed up, feel free. It'll be fun. And this is an, and then this is also an opportunity for us to connect. If you or anyone is interested in doing one of these workshops, um, please feel free. We did a handful at Sunday Parkway throughout the summer, and those were probably the biggest turnouts. So we want to be in the community. We want to be boots on the ground. We don't just want to be in downtown. But I think the hardest part right now is finding this connection. So if you are interested, please. Um, Send us, an email, send us an email, whether you're a company or a CBO, um, et cetera. We look forward to hearing from you. Um, and yeah, and that just about does it for my deck of the slides. Simbi's going to take over and speak more on what's happening soon here at Ford. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio. And I am going to give a brief overview into our Clean Rural Shared Electric Mobility Project, which is called um, the Cruise Project for short. Uh, this fall, Forth will launch its next equity project, the Clean Rural Shared Electric Mobility Project. The project seeks to demonstrate the round-trip plug-in electric vehicle car sharing and how that can serve rural communities in a financial sustainable way while benefiting low-income residents, government, and local businesses, the town at large, and tourists. In this project, we'll have five undeclared EVs that will be stationed 
throughout Hood River, Oregon, at affordable housing sites, the city center, and tourist destinations. Envoy Technologies will provide the car sharing platform enabling users to reserve and access vehicles via a smartphone, paying by the minute or by hour, and returning the cars to its home base. As part of this project, Envoy will provide a Spanish translation of its app, alternate payment mechanisms to meet the needs of those without access to credit cards or bank accounts, and tiered pricing structures enabling different prices to be charged to different users, um, user group, enabling the potential for subsidies to be offered to qualified user groups. Um, fourth, we'll work with the City of Hood River, Hood River Columbia Area Transit, the Port of Hood River, and Ride Connect, along with several community organizations such as the Columbia Cascade Housing Corporation and Mid-Columbia Economic Development District to access transportation needs and enable envoy car sharing at optimal parking locations. Fourth is pleased to partner with Pacific Power, the local utility, to execute this project. And finally, Fourth and Columbia Willamette Clean Cities Coalition will disseminate the findings via webinars, conferences, and regional workshops to publicize results and entice other clean city coalitions to pursue initiatives, uh, initiating car sharing um, programs in rural communities nationwide. And um, hopefully with the success, the cruise project will bring electric car sharing services to underserved rural communities nationwide, providing rural America with improved transportation access, energy efficiency benefits, environmental benefits at a low cost to the users. Work on this project is set to begin this November and will launch the car sharing services estimated for spring of 2020. And we hope you're able to join us when we start the webinars as we begin to further, as this program uh, project moves further along. And with that, we will open it up to Q&A. Um, here we have information from, information on how you can contact the speakers today. Feel free to shoot them an email or you can send them directly to forth and we will move them along. And as a reminder, we will be sending the webinar presentations and also the slide deck to um, all of the attendees. And you can also find the recording of the webinar on our YouTube channel as well. So let's get through the first questions. Um, so this is for Vivian. Um, funding for the Verde project um, case study, was that received from the city and was it specific to transportation electrification? Um, thanks for the question. So this, pro this needs assessment was done before my time, uh, but my understanding is that there was not funding from the city of Portland in order to conduct the Cully and Verde needs assessment. Um, I believe the needs assessment was in part uh, partially funded by Forth and um, some private foundations as well. But no, it was not funded by the city. Thank you. Okay, next question. It sounded like there was a gap in knowledge about car sharing. Um, how long are these amenities being committed? Um, how long are we providing this um, the amenities, whether it's car sharing, electric bike sharing, to the community? And how are we um, how are we um, closing the gap of knowledge and making sure that the resources are available through education and management? And this is open to both speakers. Yeah, I can highlight a little bit on this um, in regards to both uh, I mean, that, the projects of Ernest and the with the EV and the e-bike project. We did workshops um, for both projects. Um, given the funding, they were limited and the turnouts were not great. Um, but, I, but I think that was probably the best method of us doing. And I know the um, residents, the resident manager over at SM did a great job of going door to door or just handing off things in their mail as kind of like a, hey, this is what's going on um, in the plaza. Feel free to come by if you're curious. I think one of the recent ones that we learned through this PGE grant fund was doing the outreach with the community stakeholders was letting them know if you want to get an electric car or a charging station or an e-bike fleet for your residents or for your community, but you, you don't think they're ready, you can totally ask to put funds that are only going to educate workshops on what these things mean. Um, we had this analogy of having, you know, three apples in a basket rather than having one, you know, you don't want to, we all want to get three really good apples in the basket, but you don't, 
wouldn't expect that to. So if you want to put one by one, month to month, year by year, that's a more, it's, it's a safer option and, it, and it's going to lead to a better developed project in general. So I think the educational workshop um, and asking for that kind of funding was probably the safest thing to do because you are setting up for success rather than going um, deep in the first hand and then setting up for failure. I'm giving, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, this, uh, you know, this, <laughs> this question kind of gets at like the, the rub of capitalism, right? <laughs> like um, in order for private uh, industry to, to demonstrate that there is a uh, familiarity, demonstrate success, um, you know, they're going to go with the most likely user group, um, which tends to be higher income people in a more concentrated geographic area. Um, and so these pilot projects, then you know, then we, then after that that first success, and that's what you know they're tailoring it to. And then it's afterwards they think like, well, how can we get more people to do it? And what about these other folks who have a lot of barriers? Whether it's because of you know a neighborhood like Cully, where uh, you know we have only 40% of our streets are paved <laughs> and we have a lot of unimproved roadways and we have a lot of transportation barriers. Um, and then it becomes a pilot project to start figuring out the, the barriers to that. Um, it would be great to see, you know, the focus if, if equity was really at the center of these projects and if folks were really trying to deliver mobility options to all, they would take a deeper dive and center, you know, equity communities and say, if we can figure out the, and overcome and address the barriers that these communities have first, um, then, then it'll be accessible to all later. I would say the same also goes for the disability community, you know, instead of having it like, oh, let's try to do a pilot project and try to figure it out after the fact, like what it would look like if we actually center the needs of those who are most directly impacted and try to solve their mobility issues, because then we actually naturally will all benefit. I think about it like a curb ramp, right? Um, that is something that obviously we have to design uh, for ADA standards, but the reality is anybody pushing a, um, a cart, <laughs> you know, pushing um, a, a child stroller, like we can all now use that ramp. Um, and it has benefits beyond just the folks who are absolutely needed for their mobility needs. Thank you. And I think something we didn't cover um, during the presentation was charging and infrastructure when it comes to the electric car sharing or um, any type of um, program or um, project we're planning. So this question goes into what uh, with the electric vehicle ideas who would pay for charging and what kind of charging are available to the community yeah great great question so um a lot of these projects are essentially grant funded so that kind of sets you for the installation etc cetera, etc cetera. as far as charging costs go which is paying for the energy um the the um the low-income housing or whoever there is involved would pay for it. To, to kind of give an example on the Hacienda CDC project, Fourth um, has been paying for that energy. Um, this is the last year that we're paying for it. But to kind of give you more of what that compares to for gasoline is we paid, I think, 50 to 100 bucks a year. I want to say 50, but we split it with another project, which is Oregon Food Bank. Um, so I needed to actually check the paper. But I we're paying $50 a year sometimes 100 times a year, depending on the fluctuation of use. So if you compare that price to what they're paying for the gasoline for what their cars are doing anyway, it's a huge save of money. Um, so if that answers your question, um, the yeah, the um, community involved would pay for it, but if you're comparing to the actual um, of what gasoline is, um, that that's the way that it would work. As far as the community charging station goes, a lot of these grant funds, um, like I said, do involve workshops um, and and we don't want to make them that those workshops include um, how to use the charging stations, how do they work, and what kind of credits do you need, whether it's using the um, the residents of using the, for example, Hacienda's um, card, and that works too, but essentially it's what's going to make it easier, because to be frank, there, there is no charging infrastructure that is cash only, and that is a huge barrier in the industry itself, and as Vivian said, it, is a, it does revolve around capitalism. Um, we'd like to see a charging station that could take cash, like you know, a gas station would, but that doesn't exist yet. This question is for Vivian. Um, was the need assessment geared towards just electrification and electric solutions, or was it an open-ended transportation needs assessment? 
Um, so again, there was two needs assessment. Uh, the first one was based in the Cully neighborhood, um, and the catalyst for that was really trying to address the Las Arlitas redevelopment and understanding the, the needs of the community. So electrification was only one aspect of it, um, of course, because uh, Fourth Mobility is a partner um, in this work, and we also recognize that there is more and more conversation happening in the transportation world around electrification that we wanted to address it, but that was only one aspect of it. And the second needs assessment, um, or the, I'm sorry, the parallel, these actually all happened uh, at a relatively similar period of time, which I think is, is quite interesting. Um, but the, the OPAL one in partnership with PSU um, and fourth in the city of Portland was really talking uh, more broadly around uh, smart mobility and technology. And we touched on, again, electrification as a part of that. And to Sergio, um, what was the ratio of the level one, two, or three um, PG support provided for the um, drive change fund? Yeah, so um, we can't disclose the numbers, but I will give you a percentage ratio. So I would say 20% um, were categorized as level three, um, which involved pretty heavy assistance. 40% um, I would say were level two, which were moderate assistance. And then 40% um, were level one, which are very, very... Um, one meeting, one phone call, follow up, vice versa, and that was kind of just to let them know what the the options are. Um, you know, for example, electric buses, electric cars, charging stations, et cetera. So I would say 40, 40, 20 was the ratio for those three. And a clarification from a previous question. Um, this is in regards to um, Vivian, um, your statement about the good news from the city of Portland in regards to funding. And the question was posed, is this, fun is this new funding specific to transportation electrification? Oh, no, no, no. The good news for that was that Las Adelitas is finally going to be built as an entire development thanks to the Portland Housing Bond uh, Grant Selection Committee. Um, Las Adelitas was eligible to receive funding from a voter-backed uh, housing bond. Uh, so those of you in the city of Portland who voted for that, thank you because you're helping to create affordable housing in our communities. Um, and the final piece of the funding for the overall development and uh, for which um, you know, this kind of mobility hub idea has been worked into the design will be one aspect of that. But the primary goal of that was, again, to um, acquire an affordable housing site and bring more additional, um, you know, permanently affordable housing in our communities. Thank you. And this is in regards to electric bikes. Um, what kind of adoption of electric bikes are you seeing in the Kali or communities of concern? And what do you think some of the barriers are to electric bike adoption? Yeah, it's a good question. So as of right now, um, the adoption of e-bikes in Kali specifically is not, uh, I would say, a heavy um, visible thing. Um, we don't have numbers on it because we can't, we're having a hard time finding numbers in the state of Oregon in general. Um, but one of the things that um, we can speak upon that is the barriers to that adoption essentially in the neighborhood is just that those e-bikes specifically are seen as a target of theft. So a lot of individuals don't ride and ride those bikes because they don't want to be targeted um, and deemed as unsafe. So I think a lot of the efforts that we're trying to do moving forward is making sure that um, we can allocate those e-bikes back to the community of Coley in ways where primarily they keep the bikes, uh, but B, that they are seen as a regular use. It's just like scooters. And when this project ended for the community e-bike project, we were confident that e-bikes were going to explode in the air. But then within that year, e-scooters came out and that kind of took over the industry. So right now the focus has shifted e-scooters in general, not just for us, but I think for the entire industry. Um, but we are internally working to chop up more e-bike programs that are going to be specified to communities that actually need it. Yeah, I'll also add on that, you know, I think e-bikes are challenging because, you know, in Cully, we have a high percentage of renters and there's not a lot of uh, great storage facilities on site um, for people. Um, just really not a lot of options for folks. Uh, and if you're planning to store an e-bike in your apartment, uh, good luck, you know, hauling that up a few flights of stairs. You're just not going to ride it every day if that's what, how you have to store it and use it. Um, so people don't. So again, uh, land use, um, you know, what type of housing you live in. Uh, that that all matters, and uh, the Opal needs assessment does dig into that in, in the data portion, so um, you can check that out. Thank you, Bo. And we'll take one final question, uh, and this is in regards to the Hood River uh, Cruise uh, Pilot Project. Um, will it prioritize affordable housing residents over the general public, and how will we do this? 
And we are working with our partners, whether it's the housing authority, to determine how best to disseminate the um, resources that we have. And um, I will also include our program manager, Kelly Yurick's information to the recap. She's able to be point on any questions regarding the cruise project and how that is moving along. And with that final question, we will, um, I would like to say thank you all for joining us today. Thank you to Ride Report for sponsoring this webinar. And to our speaker, Vivian and Sergio, thank you for an amazing presentation today. Feel free uh, to continue the conversation after this webinar, we'll send the recap. So if you have any additional questions or any question um, that rise up last minute that we didn't get, get to, please feel free to forward that information over to us. Um, we will get through all of them and our speakers will be excited to get some more information or contact with um, you all, especially in regards if you, you or your community organization is interested in one of the scooter um, workshops, um, please contact Sergio for that. And we hope you're able to join us on November 12th for our next webinar, which will be the Micromobility Policy Playbook. We will be joined by our Senior Director of Public Affairs and Policy, Jeanette Shaw, and she will be joined by guest speakers, Seth Schultz, Executive Director of Streets for Hall Coalition and founder and CEO of Urban Breakthroughs, and Regina Clello, uh, CEO and founder of Populous. And they will discuss current policies around micromobility guidelines and how cities and state regulators and regulations can create safe streets while meeting the sustainable safety and economic goals. Um, the webinar will also be brought to you by Ride Report and we thank you all for joining us today and look forward for more information from Forth and from Ride Report and from Verde. Thank you all and have a wonderful day.